Mark Kepler, Purdue University Extension Service, and I'm here today with one of my master gardeners, and that's Ruth Reese, one of our uh, people that lives here in the county. And one of the things that Ruth does a lot of, and she gives a lot of programs on, are butterflies. And you're interested in butterflies, and you've done a lot of things with butterflies. And I'll ask you, how long have you been doing that, and what really piqued your interest at a younger age in butterflies? I remember in fifth grade, we had to draw a lot of pictures in science class. And I remember drawing the pictures of the moths and butterflies. I wish I still had the pictures, yeah. of course I don't. But then as an adult then, I just got to wondering about them. And when I took the class, I thought, well, let's see what I can find out. And I found out a little bit, and then I took it from there, started doing programs, found out I could raise them, and took the pictures, and that's, how I got going. Well, every year you give a lot of programs to some kids like second graders, third mm -hmm. grade, and all the different graders you give them to, mm -hmm. kids in school, but uh, how many have you done in the last year? Well, I do the whole second grade here in Rochester, and then occasionally I go to Plymouth, Marshall okay. County, and do the, for the beginning 4-H programs for some of the school classes. But then I do garden clubs and church groups and just anything. That's... So at your place, which we're at right now, mm -hmm. you also plant a variety of plants that are ones that bring in butterflies to mm -hmm. your place. Um, and uh, we'll take a, take a look at some of them. But I, we're going to start off with probably the, the, um, uh, the big butterfly, the one everybody always talks mm -hmm. about, and that's a monarch butterfly. Mm -hmm. You've got a one that's had uh, a better life mm -hmm. than it's got right now <laughs> in your hand, and that's a monarch. Tell us a little bit about that monarch. Mm -hmm. Okay, this monarch um, obviously came from an egg that was laid on one of these milkweed plants, and it uh, hatched into a caterpillar and, and started its four-stage life cycle. And then when it became an adult, then it started that again. What's so interesting about the monarchs is that during the winter time, they fly to Mexico and hang around all winter for seven months. And then they, uh, when it's warm out in March, they start back north, find a patch of milkweed, lay their eggs, and then they all die. And those eggs hatch out, start a next generation. So the butterfly that flew by here in the fall on the way to Mexico never comes back. Its great grandchildren do. And so that's why we need milkweed plants planted wherever they can be to provide the host plant because that's the only thing they survive on is a milkweed plant. So what's unique about a monarch is it's easily counted mm -hmm. because it all goes to that one place down there mm -hmm. in Mexico. And so people can sit there and say, oh, this year there were so many thousand monarchs. Millions. Or million yeah, monarchs. Millions. Or guess what? The population has dropped this mm -hmm. much or it's went up this mm -hmm. much. And that's what goes on with the monarch. It really falls comes back up gradually, mm -hmm. falls again. Do you know where we're currently at? Are we on the way down, the way up? Um, I always read an article in March telling where the numbers are in Mexico. And a few years back, there was a big freeze. Well, that took out a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's years where they jump back. And it's just hard to tell. The weather, sometimes the weather is just terrific, terrible, or whatever between here and Mexico. They, because they have to get there and they have to get back. So if there's bad weather patterns going on, that affects their flight patterns and whether they, how many get back up here. One monarch can lay 400 eggs, but the, I don't know the percentage of those that would survive to adulthood, but they need to do that in order to keep the numbers up. Yeah, I always heard a number like, uh, if every fly was allowed to have all of its, <laughs> its, its young and less than a year we'd be four foot deep in flies across this earth and so it, it's amazing what the potential is mm -hmm. but the actual number that make it is, is a lot less mm -hmm. so you do your part in trying to promote locally and everybody mm -hmm. else can do this too mm -hmm. uh, plants that, 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 can, that can keep the monarch butterfly and keep it going and i've got one right in front of me right here and that's just your milk weed mm -hmm. now i like to emphasize the word weed and a long time ago that's as an agriculture if we were to say, and this had been our ancestors, were to say, what's well, one of the real problem weeds on your farm? It was a milk weed. Well, now in agriculture, we fairly got this under control. We don't really have it as a weed so much on our farm, so there is less of them, so there is less potential areas for these monarchs to go to feed on them. Mm -hmm. And they like feeding on these milkweed plants. Mm -hmm. Now. It's really interesting to me is and the thing about a milkweed is if you take one of the leaves, you break it off, and you'll see the milk mm -hmm. come out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of toxic, but it's not for these guys. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, 
come along in nature, that's what they ate, and they're used to eating that, that milky substance on those milkweed uh -huh. plants. Uh -huh. So what is our timing as far as when do the eggs get laid and when do the, the monarchs come around? And, and, and uh, we're seeing that right now. And by the way, it's the first of, uh, first of August right uh -huh. now is what we're looking at, uh -huh. and this is what's going on. Uh -huh. Uh, sometime early part of June, depending on the weather. If there's been a lot of rain, it won't happen as early, but the milkweeds are up by then, and then you'll occasionally see one of the monarchs. Many times I'll find an egg before I actually see the monarch that was there that laid it, and I'm always so happy to see that first monarch. And I'll come out here and I'll look underneath the leaves, and if I see the little white spot, um, then I'll take that leaf off and put it in a container with a little bit of water in the bottom to keep that leaf alive. And then when that egg hatches, then that caterpillar has its nourishment right there. It can't eat a dead leaf, it has to eat a live leaf. So then um, they uh, are a caterpillar for, oh, maybe, well, they're, a, they're an egg for three or four days, and then they're a caterpillar in different stages for another almost two weeks. And then they make their chrysalis, and that's another 12 days, and then they'll hatch out into an adult butterfly. So um, the interesting thing is that happens all summer until about Labor Day, and those monarchs that hatch out don't have that short life cycle. Instead of mating and laying eggs, that's when they migrate to Mexico, oh. and they hang around down on those trees and soak up the uh, winter sun down there. And then when it comes March, that's when they start to mate, and lay their eggs and then they will die. So they live seven months, but the ones that hatch out in June up here in July and August, they only live two weeks. So it's fascinating that there are those changes in these. Well, it, anytime you walk out here, you could find an egg, mm -hmm. you could find a young larva, or you could mm -hmm. find what the, you call crystallics, which is where it uh -huh. pupates mm -hmm. and develops into that adult moth that mm -hmm. we're looking at. Butterfly. Yeah, thank you, mm -hmm. butterfly. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, and, 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 their moths. and the other thing you brought up here was, it's really interesting to me, is lots of times when I look at moths, they lay a bunch of eggs in a group mm -hmm. underneath a leaf, but this butterfly does not do that. No, they spread them out, which is great. And that way, if something would happen to one plant, say, then there's still some that can survive on another plant because I have patch over there and over here and over there, and it just spreads it all around. It's just a much better uh, chance of survival. So you encourage people not to cut down their milkweed plants right? because this is a potential uh, thing for these butterflies, larvae to eat upon mm -hmm. and to lay their eggs upon. And, and we really do see more and more of these down along our roadsides mm -hmm. and not out in our farm fields. Right. And so they really add to that. Now, when you look at these, when you have a milkweed plant, we've got pods on these plants. Mm -hmm. Uh, when those pods go to seed, you you here in your yard though, you take those pods off. There. I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's a perennial. It'll come right back up next mm -hmm. year from seed, so mm -hmm. or from the roots. Right. It'll come right back up, and it won't have an, uh, an issue with it. Mm -hmm. So this is a really unique plant, and it's one of those natural plants. Mm -hmm. There are other plants though that we can plant. We actually plant in our garden that can be utilized for just exactly enticing in butterflies besides monarchs. Mm -hmm. So let's just take a break here and we'll go take a look at some of those other plants. Okay, okay Ruth, we're taking a look at some of the different kind of plants here uh, that would be ones that attract butterflies into my garden. Mm -hmm. And this is specifically one of those in that milk weed family mm -hmm. that uh, would attract the monarch in. What is this one we're looking at? Uh, it's says orange butterfly flower. I, I call it a, a butterfly weed with this okay. orange blossoms. And this is such a delicate little plant and it doesn't get big and maybe obnoxious to some people like that over that one over there. But anyway, it's pretty that they will lay their eggs on here and you will see the caterpillars and so forth. And then uh, this another one is here. my favorite is what they call swamp milkweed. When you have the word swamp and weed in the same name, it, yeah. it's two strikes against it. But <laughs> to me, it's so dainty it, and of all the milkweeds, and yes, there are even white flowering varieties. This one is hardy, except for the wind that comes along and knocks it over. But I'll find there's several eggs on it now and I'll find the caterpillars. My grandson found a caterpillar right up here in the, in the flower buds the other day. And um, it, it's just, 
uh, it's fragrant and the, the butterflies will come and nectar off of it, sip the nectar out, plus then they will lay their eggs. And yes, you will see aphids. You'll have aphids on roses, you'll have aphids on milkweed and just about everything else. It's just a pest we have to put up with. So you can't use pesticides. Yeah, obviously not. There are aphids on this thing and you can't see it so much by looking at it. But again, this is a, a plant that can handle aphids. You know, mm -hmm. It can handle them and take care of them fine. Mm -hmm. What really unique about it to me is it does have a beautiful bloom on it and it blooms very well and it really doesn't look like a weed as mm -hmm. much as it looks like a, a true flower, mm -hmm. but something that attracts in those butterflies into that and so the butterflies not only get the nectar off of it, but then they can lay their eggs and the eggs will de and the larva will develop off of it. Mm -hmm. Really unique plant and one that people ought to think about putting in their landscape. Uh, mm -hmm. Get double duty. I mean, it's not as, um, I guess, I use the word obnoxious as mm -hmm. a milkweed, mm -hmm. the true milkweed we're looking at, but it, it, it does the same job mm -hmm. uh, and it really looks nice and something you could add very easily. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at another one. Okay, Ruth, we're taking a look at some plants that attract uh, butterflies in general. This one here not, uh, is a Butterf plant? butterfly bush. Butterfly bush. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily an attractor of a monarch, but an attractor of a lot of different butterflies. Yes, any ones that are nectaring, they just love to come to these. So it's a monarch wouldn't really lay its eggs on this. No, and, no, not at all, not at all. But it would come and feed upon it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one of them. Behind it are some flocks that are in bloom this time of year. Uh, that, is that another Oops. one that the butterflies yes, like? Yes, I love to see the swallowtails especially go to the flocks plants and, and get their nectar. Okay. And so you have that, and we also have back over here some other, and it's kind of hard to see, but there are some cone flowers mm -hmm. back over in this area. Right here, some pink and white ones. Okay, all right, some pink and white clone flowers that also bring in the, the butterflies into there. So that are just some of the things you can plant that attract butterflies into your garden. Let's take a look now and see what some of these uh, monarchs look like this time of year that aren't, that aren't dead, but mm -hmm. are very much alive. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ruth, um, we're taking a look at your little collection here mm -hmm. of some of these things in the monarch line. And again, you found a leaf that had an egg underneath it, took that leaf off and went and put it in a container here. Mm -hmm. And this is what hatched out of those, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The littlest one here, this fella right here, and this guy right here. <laughs> He's really active. Yep. But here's the hole in the leaf where they first started out. And uh, of course it was on the back. The mothers generally lay their eggs underneath the leaves, which protects them from hot sun and hard rain and a few predators, but some predators are down lower and they still attack them. <laughs> so this guy is getting pretty good size. Is he yes. getting pretty close to yes, he is. his he, point? When he crawls around the lid, that tells me that he's getting ready to pupate. Hmm. And so down here is a pupa. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a chrysalis. Crystallix of these different ones. And around here, ones that already have hatched mm -hmm. out, haven't, or not yes. hatched out, but emerged. broke out, emerged mm -hmm. out of those mm -hmm. different things. And so they go from this point to that point to the point that they are a, um, uh, a butterfly. We call that complete metamorphosis is the mm -hmm. term we use in the bug world. Mm -hmm. What do you do with these when they're in this situation? Do you end up just... Uh, Releasing the butterflies yes. or use them for Af programs? After or? the wings are dry, um, then I, with my grandsons, we come out here and I set it on the back of their hand. That way you can't accidentally squeeze it if it's on the back of your hand. Okay. Or set it on a flower and we watch them take off and tell them goodbye. The boys usually give them a name of some kind and um, we okay. just uh, enjoy so much uh, being able to uh, release them into the back in the world where they started at. So you really give them a little bit of protection when you do From this. From predators, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. give them an opportunity to, yes. to go even when further. I, when I first saw a spider sucking the juice out of a little caterpillar, I thought, okay, even the spiders are after them. So that's why when I find an egg, I just bring it in right away. And I think, well, if I can help that one or this one and so forth, then we've, we're just that many ahead. How many of these do you probably hatch out during the summer? Well, it depends. One year I had well over a hundred. Mm. Uh, this year I've had less than a dozen so far. Okay. This this will give me a dozen right here, and so on. Just the years are just up and down and up and down, and you just don't know if it's weather or 
uh, habitat or just a combination of things that, you know, up here I have no control over except what's in my yard. But really, if you take a look at it on, on an international level, the population is down, and so you're seeing that right here in your yard, too, mm -hmm. that the population is down. And I keep milkweed plants down along my road, and I leave them there, and I check them every once in a while, and I don't have very good luck having uh, monarchs on my milkweeds, but you do have in your yard. They seem to kind of come back to this area. You know, mm -hmm. There's something about this place they really like. Mm -hmm. And and they come back and they uh, they feed in this area. <laughs> so it's really, really interesting. There are lots of other different kind of butterflies in this world. Um, and uh, this just happens to be one of that's a very, very popular one. And Ruth, there's another thing that I want to talk about real briefly. Didn't you talk to me one time about tagging butterflies? Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. I have hey. a picture. Okay, let's wait and go do that. Okay, okay. after Labor Day. Uh, when I have a multitude of monarchs, in particular, a couple dozen at least around the same time, I can send to a place out in Kansas at the university at these little tags. And we, my grandsons and I call them license plates because every one of them has a different number. And so after Labor Day, there's a cutoff point, and that's when they start flying to Mexico from Canada all the way across the U.S. down there. And uh, when, I, uh, when the butterfly emerges after its wings are dry, uh, I fill out a sheet and I have the date that it's Rochester, Indiana, and that it was reared versus wild. I don't go out and use a net and catch any to tag them. Um, I just tag the ones that I have because it's less stressful to them. And this, they're sticky on the back and I very carefully place the sticker on there. The directions tell you how to do that. And I record the number, whether it was male or female, and then the date that it was, and then uh, I release it. And then these monarchs hopefully make it to Mexico. Uh, other people, like say down in Indianapolis, wherever the flight plan is, somebody in Indianapolis might net them. Well, then they might put a second tag on then and record the first tag. Then that gives the flight pattern of where they started out, where they are going to and all of that, and that helps scientists figure out different things. Then, after these butterflies get to Mexico, uh, they hang in the trees all winter long. Not all of them live. Of course, the dead ones are going to fall to the ground. And it's such a remote area where this is, and it's it was uh, just a few decades ago where scientists even found out where this was. But now they know where it is. The native people can go up there and they look on the ground for these little white tags on the dead butterflies. And they know that for every one of these that they turn into a special place there, they will be paid five US dollars to do that. Then those are shipped back to the University of Kansas and then they can tell uh, the areas that the butterflies came from and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, those are the ones that are dead and they won't be able to reproduce or head back. And um, then the other uh, thing with the number on here is that I can go online. At, well, I have to send in my list at the end of the season by a special date. I send in my list and then I can go online and see if any of my numbers have been found. And to date, I haven't had that luck yet because I don't do it every year because the numbers are up or down. But it's so interesting to, to have that as a hobby and find out what you can uh, do with that and help the scientists as they track these. That's a really interesting thing. I think about, you know, I'm, I'm a cattle person. We put ear tags on mm -hmm. our cattle. And you're, you're essentially putting a, a wing tag on these mm -hmm. things, a little light wing tag that doesn't interfere with them and mm -hmm. still have that opportunity to go and fly down there. It's just amazing. Uh, the lives of butterflies, and this is one that's really gotten very, very popular. Mm -hmm. So what we can do as individuals is we can encourage uh, things by butterfly, keeping our milkweeds along our roads and, and not killing them off, by planting plants in our garden that are really do attract butterflies and flowers that are along that line. And because this is just the monarch, there's a lot more butterflies mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to see all the different kinds that are out there and, and, and what we can do to help them out. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Ruth, well, thank you very much. This is Mark Kepler, and this is Ruth Reese, and we're talking to you from the Purdue Extension Service and Master Gardener here about butterflies and the butterfly gardens, and I think it's really, really interesting. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you.